Welcome to the first real talk of this retreat. It's much better quality of sound now. Yeah, so people can, can hear. So I better say something profound this morning, seeing as everyone can now hear me. <coughs> so yesterday I was just giving a basic introduction to meditation. I mentioned one of the, the core principles of meditation. Uh, it is uh, to create stillness. For those of you who wonder how that, <coughs> how that matches with insight, I like using the simile that when the lake is still, in other words, there are no waves on the surface of that water, only then will it perfectly reflect the stars, the moon, and the, the hills surrounding it. But if there's just one ripple on that lake, it will distort the reflection. In the same way, just one little thought in the mind, one disturbance distorts the truth of things. We don't see what's really there. Which is why the Buddha often said that stillness is a cause for seeing things as they truly are. Samadhi pachaya yata bhuta yanadasana. So it's one of the reasons why that stillness is the path there's another saying of the Buddha, samadhi mago asamadhi kumago. Stillness is the path, and the lack of stillness is no path at all. So the whole purpose of this meditation retreat is to try and bring the mind to a state of stillness. And all the talks I'll be giving at the, certainly the very first part of this retreat will always be about the tricks, the strategies to bring the mind to stillness. And obviously, please don't worry about the mind. If you haven't become still yet, or during the retreat you get frustrated, remember that very frustration is uh, causing the mind not to be still. We have to just uh, have an attitude that we are doing the job, we are practicing as best we can, and then we just let it happen just like the old simile of planting a tree. As long as you planted a seed and it's a healthy seed, you know that tree is going to grow and grow and grow and grow. Sometimes it grows very slowly, but at least you know that as long as it has water, as long as it has good soil and sun, then eventually it has to grow. And that's just what happens with our meditation. All we need to do is to keep on making sure we're planting our seed in a good place. <coughs> this is a good place. And we water it and keep the sun shining on it. You now the water is you know, the wisdom, the understanding which you have about uh, meditation. And the sun is the, is the kindness and the, the mindfulness, you know, the light of the sun and the warmth of the sun. So with kindfulness and mindfulness, having some wisdom from all these teachings, being in a good place, now your tree will eventually grow. But if you try and make your tree grow too fast, it will die. Many times people like to use fast fertilizer on their trees. Or they shout at it, come on, I haven't got much time, grow! And of course, you're wasting your time. Trees never grow that way. You have to be patient. And patience is the fastest way. And on that matter of patience, on allowing this meditation to grow, some years ago I noticed there are two types of patients. One the right patience, one the wrong type of patience. The wrong type of patience is waiting for something to happen. It's called waiting in the future. And for a lot of times the people practice that and think that that's being patient. When is the bell going to ring? When are we going to have lunch? When is my, <coughs> my mind going to be peaceful? When is the aircraft going to depart? All of those waiting in the future, it's not being patient at all. It causes you a lot of stress, as here I am and you want to be somewhere else. That's called waiting in the future, waiting for something to happen. The other type of waiting is the correct form of patience, which is waiting in this present moment. I like to change the meaning of the term slightly. 
and use the, the way that a waiter waits on a table. You're waiting in this moment because you see the customers in the restaurant and a good waiter can perceive now is the time they want their plates changed. Now is the time they would like their dessert. And if a waiter can wait in the moment rather than waiting in the future, is always aware of what's happening right now and can react appropriately and get good tip. So hopefully I'm waiting on all of you, so please, big tip. <laughs> so we have waiting in the moment is the right type of patience. So we're not looking again into the future or the past, always focusing on this present moment. Understanding that if we keep focusing on this present moment, the future will look after itself. As long as we're watering and uh, protecting and keeping the, the tree in the sunshine right now, we know it must grow. Because this is the whole basic theory of Buddhism, of cause and effect. As long as we know the cause of things, we know the effect will happen eventually. And so, just again, going off on a tangent, sometimes people come here and say, well, you know, can we get jhanas and become enlightened? We're only lay people, whatever. And the way the Buddha answered that type of question was profound and very encouraging. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a monk or a lay person, whether you are male or female or gay or transgender or whatever, as long as you're practicing the Eightfold Path, as long as you put the causes into place, then enlightenment happens. It doesn't depend upon you, it depends upon what you do and how you do it. Put the causes into place, practice the Eightfold Path, and the Buddha guaranteed, yes, where you find people practicing the Eightfold Path, you'll find streamless ones, returners, non-returners, full enlightened ones. That's in the Mahaparinibbana Sutra. So that gives you encouragement. All you have to do is put the causes in place right now. So you put the causes into place, again, of mindfulness and kindness, listen to the Dhamma, and you'll know that eventually the meditation will get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, more and more still. The waves on the surface of your mind will get less, and eventually you, know, you start seeing the truth, you get wise and happy. And this is just nature. Now, one of the problems is, especially with people from places like Singapore, you haven't got much time, so you want to get enlightened this week. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, your trees don't grow according to human schedules. So all you can do is do the very best you can and to see how much you develop over the next week. And it's great not to have goals. If you come to this retreat with any goal, say, yes, this time I'm really going to get jhanas, this time I'm going to get stream winning, or whatever goal you have, you just create yourself lots more suffering. All goals, they just neglect the present moment as you start looking at the future. You are looking at where you want to be, where you're going rather than where you are. And just like the person walking in the forest, you walk in this forest here, if you look too far ahead of yourself, you'll trip over the rock or the, the log, like right in front of you. So our job in meditation is to look at the log right in front of us now, not way over there, not even a meter ahead, but look where we are. And uh, if you have any goals, you miss what's happening now. So try and have, if you're going to have any goals at all, have the goal of not having any goals. I'm going to try not to do any trying. My aspiration is to be free of all aspirations. In other words, just be and let go and be here. Which is why yesterday I put a lot of emphasis on the present moment awareness. And the present moment was not invented by Eckhart Tolle, you only have to look at the Badekarata Suttas, where the Buddha makes a huge amount of, of emphasis on let going of the past, don't run off to the future, being the present moment. It's just a basic part of our meditation. 
And the nice thing about that present moment awareness is you can practice it anywhere, anytime, no matter what you're doing throughout this retreat. So you don't think that you're only meditating when you're on your cushion or when you're doing walking, just when you're brushing your teeth. One tooth at a time. Be here right now as you're brushing. When you're eating, just one. What do you have this morning for breakfast? Conche. One spoon of conche at a time. But you may notice. You probably notice it in yourself, and you probably notice it in other people. You have one spoon of conche already in your mouth, being tasted, about to be swallowed. And there is another spoon of conche in your spoon, waiting in line. And you're looking down at what else you're going to have <laughs> afterwards. You are three spoons of conche in front of yourself. Sometimes even more. You see that when people are eating, they're chewing something, <coughs> something's on their spoon and with their fork, they're messing around with their plate, making next piles. Do you like enjoying your food? If you enjoy your food and like to appreciate it, just one spoon at a time. So you put the spoon into your mouth and you taste it fully. Forget about the spoons coming later. If you're thinking about the next spoon or the one after it, you can't really enjoy what you're eating right now. You're not fully here. <coughs> so to enhance your Epicurean adventure in Jhana Grove, so you enjoy the food even more, Try one spoon at a time, practice. What that really means is you are appreciating the present moment even when you're eating, even when you're going to the toilet, one plop at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so don't take a book in there, don't go planning what you're going to do next. Be there. Now, you may laugh, but there's a lot of people, they do have uh, problems with uh, their colon, they get constipated, they have diarrhea. You know what it is. It's so simple, it's because they're trying to rush, because they want to go somewhere else. Or they can't relax, even on the toilet. So please, at least that one place, be in the present moment. And the next thing, once you're in the present moment, what else do you do? Let go. <laughs> And then you find you get very, very healthy as well. So in Yintoda, or most importantly, even when you're walking from one place to the other. Just to make a point of that, one evening at Dhammaloka, I gave a talk, and it's one of, the, one of the talks I like the most, which I gave on a Friday night, was called the in-between moments. Because much of your life is spent in between things. You've left the hall and you're on the way to the toilet. You're in between. You now you've uh, left home and you're on the way to the airport, in the car or the train. You're in between. And have you noticed how much of your life is spent in between things? You've left one place, you haven't arrived. For your destination. Why not again? Okay. Last it to you. We left one place. If it's if you can't hear at the back, please shout and I'll just use my natural voice. You left one place and about to arrive at another place and you're in between things. And a lot of times we waste those opportunities of being in between. And in fact you might say that the whole of life is in between. In between being born and going to your absolute destination, you know, the crematorium. <laughs> and now we're in between. Now the most important thing is when you're in between, be in between, be here. So appreciate this moment and learn as much as you can from this moment by being here. And try not to worry about where you're going next. The whole part of meditation is being here, being in between, being now. And valuing those moments. So see if you can catch yourself during this next nine days when you've left one place. <coughs> so when you've left one place and you haven't arrived at the destination yet, don't throw those moments away. They're really important. Even when you get up from your seat here to go to the walking meditation, 
you find much wisdom and stillness comes from the moment you leave your cushion to the moment you start your walking meditation. That is important. And if you, you don't have to force yourself because after a while the idea and practice of present moment awareness becomes very happy and peaceful. The first few days of a meditation you may be tired, you may feel a bit tight, but after a while you tend to relax into this present moment and it's so enjoyable just being here. I don't have to get to anywhere on time. It's not like being in Singapore. Yes, I am your boss, but I can't sack you. <laughs> so, so you're safe. And I don't, you've known me for a long time, that I don't shout at anybody or criticize them. It's one of my problems because I am far too soft, which means that Bodhinyana Monastery, there's far too many monks and Anagarikas. When I give retreats, it's always overbooked. When I go to Singapore, there's so many people who want to have photo. It's because I'm too soft. I know there is such a thing called charm school. I want to find the opposite, grumpy school. So if I can learn how to be more grumpy, then I can have more free time. <laughs> but I don't think it is my nature to be grumpy. But it's good, it means you don't have to be afraid. You can just relax and enjoy this moment. Now, sometimes people have the idea if you don't set goals, you don't achieve anything. And, but that is not how this meditation works. If you are in this present moment and if you are content, you're just happy to be here, the stillness grows and grows and grows. And stillness evolves. It just doesn't stay just you know, as you feel now. When you become still, many things disappear. And as the coarse things disappear, they reveal what is more refined. The path of stillness is the path of going in and in and in. Because it's the nature of our human brain that we can only notice things which move. Now, if there's a constant sound in the background, you will not be able to perceive it anymore. Constant temperature, constant feeling, you just don't know it anymore. But when things change, the brain can be aware of it. So this is <coughs> why when we're in this moment, we're not thinking of the future or the past, we're just here. It's not as if nothing happens. Some things disappear and other things become very clear indeed. It's one of the reasons why the breath was the most favorite meditation taught by the Buddha and still is the most a well-used meditation method. And uh, being a scientist, being brought up in the West to question everything, I often wonder, why the breath? Until when I started meditating, just uh, in a very powerful way, you did notice, you sit down on a seat, you close your eyes. The first thing I noticed when your, my eyes were closed were the inside of my eyelids. If you're aware enough, that's the first thing which you see when your eyelids are closed. But those inside of the eyelids, it's black or dark red, depending on how much light there is outside, that does not change. And because it doesn't change, you can notice after a few seconds, you don't even see the inside of your eyelids anymore. The sense of sight turns off, it vanishes you're not seeing anything at all. I learned that when I went to a Zen monastery for a retreat. In, when I was a student in the late 60s and early 70s, there was hardly any place you could go to do some meditation. So I didn't care what type of Buddhism it was. If they did a meditation retreat, I would go there. And so I went to these one of these Zen monasteries, you know, where they use the stick. Have you ever been to one of those 
sessions. Because I remember we got up early on a Sunday morning, and I was about 20, 21. You know, I know what it's like, you know, you're not genetically programmed to get up that time of the morning, especially on a Sunday morning, being English, you're supposed to be in bed half asleep. So I wasn't in bed half asleep, I was in a meditation hall half asleep with everybody else. And that's when the teacher came along with his stick. And what they do is they tap you on the shoulder before they hit you, just to give you some warning. And I've always had lots and lots of good karma. I must have had a very fortunate, good life doing lots of good karma in my previous life, because I never got hit. And the reason was, the guy next to me got hit first. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as I heard that whack on his back, I was perfect. <laughs> I had no, no tiredness at all. <laughs> it was really scary. It really makes a big noise. So, <laughs> You only need one person to get hit and everyone wakes up. But the method of meditation was strange, but I was willing to try anything just you know, to investigate. So we had to sit facing the wall with our eyes open. We weren't told really what to do except just be still. So there you were, eyes open, watching this you know, whitewashed wall. And after about 15 minutes, the strange experience happened that the wall disappeared. Now it didn't go sort of like transparent, it just there was no wall there. And that was really weird, but you know this was the 60s and 70s when people liked <coughs> weird things. You had to take all these illegal substances if you wanted a weird experience, but here was one for free. And so I was really fascinated. You know, I've never been scared of strange things which happen in the mind, any weird stuff, yeah, this is fun, this is interesting. So the wall disappeared, it wasn't there anymore. And of course that makes you think, wow, what's going on? Very simple to understand, it's one of your first experiences with sight of realising when nothing changes, the sense turns off. It's no different than closing your eyes and looking at the inside of your eyelids, but you're used to that so much you may not have noticed it. But if you go in your room and face the wall, sit with your eyes open, after a while that wall will vanish. Simply because nothing is happening. The brain is not wired to notice things which are stable. It disappears. And that is one of the most important things to understand about how meditation works. When you're still, things disappear. So, you know, you close your eyes, and after a while sight vanishes. Now you just not know how much busyness you have with sight. Looking at other people, looking at me, wondering how they're dressed, or what they look like, and who they are the visual sense takes a huge amount of gigabytes in our brain. And imagine when that's all stopped, you've got so much more freedom for the mind or the brain to observe other things. When you're not taken up so much by the business of seeing. And you're sitting reasonably still and comfortably, like I said last night, please be kind to your body, look after it, because if you look after the body and you're reasonably comfortable, nothing much is going on in your body. The knees are comfortable, the back is okay. It's one of the reasons I did ask Dania to make sure that there was the heater on this morning. Sometimes people, well, they're not complain, but they wonder, why is jhana grove so comfortable? Now, surely in meditation retreats you have to suffer. <laughs> you know, be in bedrooms with three other, four other people where there's always one snorer, have bad food, queue up for toilets, and be in either freezing or boiling hot meditation room. And of course, that is not the way to develop meditation. You need a comfortable body. So that's why we try and make sure you have good food. A comfortable place to sit and sleep at night. So you can sit down in meditating and there's hardly an ache or a pain on the body. The body is comfortable. 
When it's comfortable, there's no aches or pains because nothing is going on in your body. What do you think happens to your body? It vanishes, it disappears. And so this other big amount of business for your brain, physical feelings, vanish. They're not there anymore. Woohoo, I'm free. Now that will only happen if you're reasonably comfortable. If you've got an ache or a pain in the body, that will keep you tied to your body and you will not be able to be free from the body. The body will not disappear unless you are very, very skilled in your meditation. Most people can't do that. So please look after your body, keep it comfortable. And on that point, if during the meditation, you know, you need to move, please move. If I've got an ache in my knee, I'm getting old now, if my knee aches, I don't just sit there. Come on, Ajahn Brahm, endure. You're a tough monk. <laughs> as soon as I know, I know my body that well, if it's just this little irritation, I know it's going to disappear, I don't bother about it, but if it's that pain which I know from experience is going to get worse and worse, I move. It takes about 20 seconds to move. The pain disappears and now I can carry on meditating. That way you get far deeper in your meditation when your body is comfortable. Please remember that this is how the Buddha taught. The Buddha never asked anyone to experience pain or meditate on pain. That was not one of the Buddha's meditation subjects. The Buddha never ever taught anapena sati. <laughs> Anna means along with sati mindfulness. Never sought mindfulness along with pain. Anapana, yes, mindfulness is along with the breathing, but not anapena sati. So if you're experiencing pain, you are practicing anapena sati. That is not what the Buddha taught. So please look after your body, and then the body can vanish. When it does vanish, some retreat some years ago, a Singaporean guy, he was meditating and then he came out, put his name out on the interview, he said, I must see you, I must see you, I must see you. I said, what's happened? He said, I was meditating and my hands disappeared. Great, what's the problem? Is that supposed to happen? Yes, it's good. It means there's one part of your body you don't have to worry about. Now let the rest of it disappear as well. But because it had never happened to him before, and because he didn't understand what was going on, he got scared. So please expect the whole of your body to vanish. So when the body vanishes and the sight vanishes, hearing is a very difficult thing to let go of. That's why the only way is to please, 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 Try and be quiet, because imagine, imagine you come in and bang the door just when someone is about to become enlightened. And you, because of you, they don't. Imagine the bad karma for them. <laughs> Who I would like to be you in your next life. <laughs> So really be careful when you come in here because out of respect for other people. Because little noises, they can really disturb people. So other than that, it's a reasonably quiet place. Yeah, there's the sound of the birds, but they're in the distance. And after a while you find you don't hear things. The sense of hearing disappears because there's no change at all. So you let go of three senses, smell, Smell is pretty easy to get rid of, as long as people don't pass wind. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's why that we used to have so much incense in Buddhist temples. <laughs> people didn't used to wash so much in those days. <laughs> so that was the way they could get rid of all the smells. There's sometimes that people do all these these customs in Buddhism, and they ask, why? And why do you have candles? And why do you have incense and flowers in Buddhist temples? And so, you know, sometimes we just follow our ancestors without really understanding why. You've all heard me probably in Singapore that 
I could not believe that, you know, in Thailand when people put incense into the bowl, they just put it in. But any Chinese temple, especially Singapore, they take the incense and they shake it first of all before they put it in. And you know why? As I've told many people before, it is because in Asian culture, whether it's in Sri Lanka or Thailand or Hong Kong or Singapore or Malaysia, you always go to the temple with your grandma first of all. She's the one who usually takes the grandchildren into the temple to show them what to do. And grandma takes the incense and shakes it before she puts it into the bowl. And the children follow suit, thinking that's the right thing to do. The only reason why grandma shakes is because she's got Parkinson's disease. <laughs> <laughs> and all the kids, they follow, even though they haven't got Parkinson's. And that's where the custom of shaking the incense comes from. <laughs> Well, please don't need to do that at all, unless you really have got Parkinson's, and fair enough. But, <laughs> but when we get to things vanishing and disappearing, you find that when all of that has vanished, the one thing which is left, you know, which is very difficult to stop, is your breathing. So even if you don't try to watch the breath, eventually the breath will come to you. It's the only thing left which is moving. That's why it becomes a natural object of meditation. Now for those of you who follow the instructions, present moment awareness and silence, you'll find a lot of the time you don't have to go looking for the breath. When everything else disappears, the breath is the last thing left. And I must admit that that's the way that I meditate. When I started meditating, I was watching the breath, but I found that was nowhere near as effective as just letting go of everything else until the breath was the only thing left. What that meant was when the breath appeared in my mind when I meditated, it was always really peaceful, even the very first time. If you try and watch the breath, you will find it's never comfortable when you first watch it. It's always unnatural. You're forcing your attention onto the breath. So I really encourage that method of just letting go, being in the present moment, being silent, stop all this thinking business, and just sit there, watch things go until the breath just comes to you then that's a very, very wonderful way of meditating. When the breath does come to you, you, know, you don't just do anything with it. Remember, you're supposed to be in the present moment, just sitting there, letting go. And you will find, because you are not doing very much, not even thinking, your body is not metabolizing so much. It does not need so much oxygen. If you are working, walking backwards and forwards, of course you need to take in more fuel to burn more carbohydrates. That's one of the reasons why, you can see how much I eat. Actually, I don't eat that much. The reason I get fat is because my metabolism is so, so little, because I don't think enough. I should worry more. If I learn how to worry more, <coughs> then I would lose a lot of weight. <laughs> because this is all it is, the body just, you know, it sort of burns carbohydrates because it does work. Because, you know, I just sit here and meditate, I don't do much work. And of course, you know, you don't use so much fuel, it just gets stored up for the next day and the next day and the next day, <laughs> that's what happens. Because I've been watching you, sometimes, you know, I have my lunch, and you guys have your lunch as well. And I see how much you eat and how much I eat, and I eat about half as much as you guys do. And that's my last meal of the day. I was just in Malaysia, just can't believe how much people eat. And, you know, for, for the retreat, uh, for the BGF, and they were eating heaps. And I just, that's my one meal of the day. What are you doing? And they're having another meal in the evening. But, but they, they guys don't put on weight. Because you must worry too much and burn it all off. But anyway, the, 
because you're not doing very much, not even thinking in meditation, you don't need so much oxygen, which means you don't breathe so much, which means your breath gets very soft, very light and very peaceful. It's nature. And because it gets very soft and very peaceful, the breath gets very smooth and even. And this is where, guess what? Your breath disappears. And that's what is supposed to happen. It gets so still, it vanishes. So just this stillness business, it doesn't mean that you're always experiencing the same thing. When you become still in the present moment, not thinking, just being here, all these things vanish. When they vanish, oh, it's so wonderful. You don't have to see anything, hear anything, process anything. Your body has disappeared. I was telling my monks the other day that one of those stories of just the bliss of having your body vanish, especially when you get old. You've got lots of aches and pains the older you get. And even when you're young, you sometimes have aches and pains in the body. And I told the monks about that time I had typhus fever. What was that over in? Malaysia, I forget now. I had this terrible typhus fever, three or four weeks, and it was like typhoid. No one really knew what it was. It was a third world hospital, you know, where, you know, there's nothing, nothing, nothing like hospitals today. And that was the place at six o'clock, the night nurse vanished. Or the, no, the nurse, there was only one nurse at the station, with a ward of about 12 beds. And just without telling anybody, the guy just left and no one came back all night. About two hours later, I asked one of the monks, should we tell someone the night nurse hasn't come? And he told me there is no night nurse. If something happens in the middle of the night, it's just bad karma. <laughs> you know, that was not reassuring at all when you got this terrible fever, no one knows what it was. And for 12 hours of the day, you had no one looking after you at all. No alarm bells to ring. A long way to the next ward to shout for anybody. If something happened in the middle of the night, that was it, you're dead. So that was pretty scary. And I won't go into the, the uh, syringes I used to use in those days. You know, these days people, they, you know, they, some people are afraid of these injections. These injections, the needles are so sharp. and, recite, and and they only used once. In those days, those needles were used many, 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 many times. They were just boiled, hoping all the, the any bacteria would be, uh, would be killed by the, the boiling. But it doesn't kill all the bacteria. There's always some left. And they keep shoving it inside of you. And I, I can't ever forget the trauma of this nurse who would come in and inject me twice a day in my buttocks. Because it was just a cocktail of antibiotics, because they didn't know it was typhus fever. And you know, the fever was still very high. And this nurse, you know, she was maybe about 40 years of age, I can still picture her now. And she was, you know, not petite. She was built like a water buffalo. <laughs> like some Russian weightlifter in those days. This really big girl. And she had to be, because she turned over, whack! in your buttocks, because it was, the needles were so blunt, that's the only way they could inject you. You can't just push it in, it has to be stabbing you. <laughs> <laughs> that really hurt. And it doesn't matter how, how compassionate you are, even Kuan Yin would have hated that nurse. <laughs> <laughs> so that was what it was like in those hospitals. You, if you've ever had a fever for such a long time, in, third world country, you just feel absolutely zero energy. You feel so tired and everything aches. And it was just one time I decided, yes, you know, you're a monk, you know how to meditate, let's meditate. And of course you could. The wonderful thing to know that no matter how much you feel, even if you've got low energy and you've got a fever, you can still just let go. It's very hard to watch the breath, but you can always let go and stop struggling and just watch everything disappear. And you can imagine just how blissful it was to watch my body vanish. 
No fever, no aches, no pains. Oh, it was such a wonderful escape out of this body. As it is for each one of you. For me it was even more in heart because of where I'd come from, from a very sick and achy body. But even now it's so beautiful to have all this body vanish. You don't have to worry about itches, about heat or cold, about seeing things. It really is like you're being released from a prison. The prison of the five senses. So when this happens, please let it happen. Don't be afraid. Don't go, ah, I can't feel my hands. Ah, my head's disappeared. Ah, my breath is gone. This is what is supposed to happen. This is what happens when you are still. These things vanish and what is left is your sixth sense, the mind, the jitter. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And it's fun and it's beautiful and it's happy and it's full of great insights when the body vanishes and you just release this thing we call the mind, the jitter. And of course you all know, as Buddhists, this mind is the most important part of Buddhism. First, first of the Dhamma part, the mind is the forerunner of all things. We've got to find out what that mind is to release it. And again, one of the Buddha's similes of the goldsmith, he said, a goldsmith has to purify the gold first of all, before they can use it to make ornaments or to find out its properties. In the same way, you've got to purify the mind first of all, before you can understand it and make use of it. And the impurities of the mind are the five senses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching means you're not really aware of the mind. It's all covered up with all this other stuff. So in this meditation we become so still. Well, the body and the senses vanish and the mind appears. And the first time that appears, it, for most people it appears as a beautiful light in the mind. Sometimes that light can be smeared all over like a screen of light, but the best ones are where it becomes just a ball of light. And I'll talk more about that later on. It's called the nimitta stage. Some of you have experienced that. But one thing which I will emphasize was uh, even a few days ago, one of the meditators, I think from Jhana Grove, who was here for the three months, they were saying, yeah, they get these lights, but they can't be the real thing, they kept on saying. And I don't know how many times that people have meditated and seen this beautiful light in their mind and have doubted it and think, oh, this can't be. I must have must be the, the sun shining through the window, must be a headlight from a car, must be someone shining a flashlight. You know that is one of the reasons I designed this hall with no windows except high up. It cannot be the sun. The sun can't shine through these windows. It's not a car headlight. Car headlights, you can't allow cars into this room. The headlights can't penetrate the brick walls. And again, it's no one's flashlight. It's light enough in here already. If you see a light, it must be an imiter. Well done. You know one of the hindrances which we talk least about, which is most, um, probably the hindrance which is least explained of, of all is the fifth hindrance of doubt. Which is Kichar. And know how the Buddha explained it. He said, being perplexed about what's a wholesome state and what's an unwholesome state. Not knowing. And that, one of the main areas of this hindrance of doubt, is when you see a nimitta. And not knowing is this a nimitta or is it not a nimitta? And because of your doubt, you spoil the progress of the meditation. So please trust that these things are the real thing and go for it. Let it be and let it develop and it gives you lots and lots of bliss. And that is the stage which I hope people will eventually reach on this retreat. At least see a few nimittas or even get even deeper. Why not? You can and all you have to do is follow the instructions. And it happens. 
But afterwards we can discuss just what to do next and how it sort of relates to insight and blah blah blah. But in the meantime, to actually to see if you can become that still that things disappear. And all the way through stillness you will experience the mind getting brighter and happier. The thing which I mentioned last night, which I'll mention again here, it's again another basic idea which underlies this path of meditation. The more still you are, the more energy you get. So yes, you're tired when you first come here, yeah, you're dull when you meditate, yeah, you know, you just drag yourself along the path back and forth from your room. But you will find, as a natural result of meditation, your energy levels will increase. And if you want to increase them fast, then do less. Think less. Be in the moment more. Because when you're not wasting energy, thinking, planning, remembering, when you're not wasting energy, your natural source of energy all goes into the mind, into knowing, into being awake, into being here. And it's a wonderful part of meditation as that energy starts to flow, you literally wake up. You know, you find you're not tired. It's not that you're not tired, you're energized, which means you can engage with whatever you hear, see or feel and it becomes much fuller and more delightful when you start going slowly and peacefully and you have more energy. The standard simile, which for those of you coming here the first time may be now able to understand, this place is up on a hill and we've been here, this is our 30th year of Bodhinyana Monastery. Actually next December, December the 1st is our 30th anniversary of Bodhinyana Monastery. We don't celebrate these things. What do you want to celebrate for? Just carry on meditating, that's good enough. Celebrations are a pain, you have to organize everything and clean everything up and make the toilets especially clean for all the visitors and talk to people all day and I've had it with talking to people all day and having photographs taken. And whenever I go to Singapore every day is a, is a ceremony. <laughs> so, so anyway, we're, not, we're going to have no ceremony for the 30th, 30th anniversary. But uh, 30 years, I was about 7 years, 6, maybe 8 years, you never remember, up and down that hill in a car. And for the first time ever in seven years, it was a beautiful spring morning. And I told the driver, let me off at the bottom of the hill. I want to walk up. And I walked up that hill. And it's quite a steep hill, you know, two and a half kilometers from the bottom to Bodhinyana Monastery Gate. And as I was walking up that hill, a strange thing happened on the way to the monastery. I could not recognize my surroundings. It looked absolutely, totally, 100% different than anything I remembered. And I'd been living up here for seven years at the time. And I was so stunned, I stopped and stared in disbelief. And as I stopped and stared, the scenery changed again. i never ever seen the grass so beautifully vibrantly green, not just ordinary green, but deep and rich. And I started to see little rocks and little flowers coming out, which I'd never noticed before. And in the bottom of the valley was a stream, and it was like diamonds in the sunlight. The whole thing was absolutely gorgeous. And I thought, how come I've never seen this before? And I realized later on, when you look through the window of a speeding car, you imagine you're seeing what's outside. But the image on the back of your eye hasn't got time to fully form. Because sight is a chemical reaction on the back of your retina. It doesn't fully form, and then another image comes up, and then another, and then another, and then another. So you only see a fraction of what's out there and the colors and the shapes are not fully developed. 
when you go slowly, when you're walking, the images have more chance to form. But when you're perfectly still, only then does it fully form. Only then do you see the real colours of nature. And they're absolutely gorgeous. Blues, greens and browns and yellows like you've never seen before. Richer, deeper than ever. And that's what will happen to you when you start slowing down and becoming still. And the whole thing which is so beautiful. This was the amazing thing. I always thought that meditation and Buddhism was about experiencing suffering. Come on, you're not really practicing unless you're suffering. <laughs> it's all suffering, they used to say. Suffer, 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 suffer. But it's not the way it is as a Buddhist monk, as a meditator. The more you meditate, the happier and more beautiful it becomes. And you start looking at life, you start looking at the floor and you see amazing stuff going on in that bamboo floor. Wow, look at that floor. And after a while, that's what will happen to you. When you get still, not only do you go deep in meditation, when you come out, whatever you see is like being polished. And you see much more. And the food becomes more delicious. If you don't like the food, then nothing to do with the cook. Everything to do with you being too dull and sleepy. As you wake up, as the meditation gets deeper, as you become more aware and more energized. Wow, such a good cook. Nothing to do with the food, everything to do with your mindfulness becoming strong. And that's where you get the great happiness of a meditation retreat. You go walking through the bush, even the rain is just so sensuous, is it? hits your skin, oh, this is great. Everything becomes delightful, which is the happiness which comes from meditation. We call that the piti sukha which comes up as you meditate. That's natural and hopefully you'll experience that. The more you are still, the less you worry, the less you think. And that's where you see monks being happy. We don't become happy because we take uh, methamphetamines, or other sort of drugs. The happiness of a monk comes from deep meditation. After, after you get into really deep meditation, you're just so happy and bubbly and have a great time. So that's again what's going to happen to you. So please do not, uh, please expect being happy. It's part of the course. Expect things to vanish and disappear. Expect joy to come up. Expect for you to be so stable, so still and so happy you're having the time of your life. Expect after a few days you don't even want to sleep much at all. Some of you will not be able to go to sleep at night. Quickly, you don't need to. You're just so still and peaceful, the brain doesn't need to sleep. Just lay down and rest the body and just get up and meditate, having a great time. And that is what happens when you become still. So still is not something which is just wasting time. As you are still, things begin to develop. As you go deeper and deeper into the five senses, into your mind, and even deeper still, which I will discuss later on. So this is your job. You know, because I was talking to some Christians uh, recently, and I mentioned this actually in the BGF, because, you know, yeah, sometimes those fundamentalist Christians are always trying to convert you. And that the higher you are as a monk, the more sort of points they get for converting you. <laughs> <laughs> so they were coming up to me and saying, Ajahn Brahm, nothing is better than God. And I said, yes, I agree with you. Said, you agree with me? Yes. Nothing, emptiness, <laughs> is much better than God. <laughs> <laughs> but I did quote in Psalms in the Christian Bible, where they, I don't know where they got this from, but it's obviously a Buddhist influence, where it says, be still and know that thou art God. Wow. That's what it says there. 
be still. Let's talk about meditation and realize this energy and the power and the bliss which you get, which no Christian would just think that's God. So you can do that here. I've often said to people, if any of you get into a first jhana, that's just past that nimitta stage, you'll have so much bliss, so much love, so much selflessness. If you were a Christian, you would actually think that that's union with God, with the Divine. And if you went back and told your priest, he would make you a saint. You would have St. Clair's College in, in Singapore. There would be St. Peter's and St. Upal's. <laughs> but that's what happens with these people. They've just got first jhana, that's all. They're not really a saint. But that's what it feels like. The, the, oneness with bliss, with immense power. Just, this is what happens when you're still. Be still. And get into these deep states of meditation. So yeah, the Christian's got it right there. Don't concentrate, don't try, because that way you'll never be still. Put the cup down, and then stillness happens. So anyway, I'll talk more about this later on. Ah, exactly now. Very good. Any questions about it so far? And again, please don't try too hard, just be gentle. Let the tree grow, don't force it for goodness sake. There's many days to go. So and if you feel tired, take rest. If you, you know, feel energized, you know, do some meditation, do some walking, whatever. Have a cup of tea whenever you want. So work with your body, but please 